Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Muriel and in this video I will be doing my long overdue 2022 yearly reading wrap-up. As with previous years, I'm just basically going to go over some of the reading highlights of last year and some of the video highlights of last year as well, and then go into a sneak peek at my 2023 TBR, which obviously given the date I've already started. First, I'm going to go over some notable non-fiction reads, then go into what I'll call noteworthy reads, so not absolute favourites, not the worst of the worst, but you know, books that stood out for whatever reason. I mean fiction books that stood out, then I'll go over the worst of the worst, and then the very best I read last year, then we'll go over some extra stuff, and then that sneak peek at my 2023. TBR. So starting off with the non-fiction, I'm going to highlight about, well, in my mind they're five books, but it's actually technically seven. I did read towards the beginning of 2022 a memoir called The Soul of an Octopus, written by Cy Montgomery. It is a memoir about this woman's relationship with a few octopuses she met at an aquarium, and goes over her investigation into, well, the nature of non-human animal consciousness, cognition, emotionality, but specifically in this instance for an invertebrate, an animal from a, a fairly separate branch of life on Earth. She goes over some of the people she met whilst doing Doing this investigation and writing this memoir, and well, the most interesting bit, the relationship she kind of developed with a few octopuses. And it was just a lovely memoir. I mean, I love those kinds of books, memoirs about relationships between humans and non-human animals. Here it was extra special because it was an invertebrate, a cephalopod, and I do love me some cephalopods. I do have a preference for squid over octopuses, but I still enjoy the latter. And yeah, it was, it was a lovely memoir. Interesting, moving, informative, and promoting cephalopods. And I would definitely highly recommend that one if you haven't checked it out yet. Another book I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed last year was this one, Bonk, <laughs> The Curious Coupling of Sex and Science, written by Mary Roach. Human sexuality is one of my special interests, and I received this as a gift, I think, for Christmas in 2021, perhaps. And this is a book about research into human sexuality, mostly from a biological point of view. Or, I mean, biological and psychological. Can you even really separate the two? Not really, but anyway. And it was a lot of fun. It was very interesting, for one thing. It gave me those satisfying special interest positive feelings is quite funny as well. And also <laughs> what's kind of neat here is that the author herself participated in a bit of research whilst she was writing this book, so she gets into interesting situations at times. And it's pretty thorough as well, it kind of goes over a lot of different aspects of human sexuality with regards to behavior, anatomy, function, etc. So I would also highly recommend this one if you have an interest in this particular topic. Kind of related in a way, though not entirely, but whatever. I did read Testosterone, an unauthorized biography written by Rebecca Jordan Young and Katrina Karkazis. It's a book I really enjoyed, though I was somewhat disappointed because, somewhat misleadingly perhaps, this nonfiction book doesn't really go into what the hormone testosterone does precisely in the human body, whether male or female, but it goes into how we conduct research about sex hormones, in this case testosterone specifically. So it's a book about tea talk, the way we do research about testosterone, the way we interpret findings from research, and how we weave this into conversations about gender, sex, and all those dynamics in wider human society. In that respect, it was very interesting, though you will get some information about what testosterone does specifically as well. The most interesting chapter of that book was definitely the one that went into how testosterone probably plays a very important role in female reproduction. So that was really neat. The weakest chapter was about how we talk about testosterone in relationship to female sports, but obviously that also touches on ideological considerations and everything 
everyone will have different opinions about that. But yeah, it was definitely a very interesting book and just once again goes to show how little we actually understand about the complexity of endocrinology, how most people when they talk about testosterone, and I, I hear this a fair bit in my little corner of the internet, people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> endocrinology is very complex, even neurotransmitters are very complex, it's not just a does X, it's A plus B in relationship to C and how it's modulated through Y does X plus Z in this context, but then does F and C in that context. So many misconceptions out there. But so just for that, I would also highly recommend that one. Though, like I said, not entirely what I was looking for when I picked it up. A very colorful nonfiction book I read was Immune, written by Philip Detmer, who is the man behind the channel Kultgesagt, in a nutshell, so it's a science vulgarization channel, and Immune is a book that vulgarizes immunology. And I was familiar with a lot of the information presented in the book, because I studied some of that at university, but it was really nice to get a pretty thorough refresher course, and I just kind of love the illustrations. The illustrations are of the same style you'll find in this man's videos, or I mean on his channel. They're very colorful and cartoony, but in a way that makes the information easily understandable. So that's what you get in this book. I kind of hope he does a similar thing for other topics in science and or medicine, because that would be really neat. But I would kind of recommend this book for the illustrations alone, but honestly it is actually a very good treaty of scientific vulgarization or medical vulgarization as well. And it is a very interesting subject, immunology, the immune response, the inflammatory response, because that probably lies behind a lot of medical conditions, both purely physiological and like mental physiological, if you see what I mean. So that's another one I would definitely recommend. And then last year I decided to tackle in a way the topic of pornography and how it is or at least can be harmful, especially big porn, mainstream, big platform pornography or gonzo porn, whichever way you want to call it. I decided to read three books on the topic back to back. That was a terrible mistake on my part because wow was it triggering. <laughs> but I wanted different points of view on the subject, negative points of view but from different angles. So I read Your Brain on Porn. Can't remember the name of the author but you'll see it in the thumbnail thingy. That was from the point of view of a man primarily concerned with the effects of pornography on male sexuality slash male sexual function or dysfunction, because really it focuses in on pornography addiction. I read The Porn Myth, written by Matt Frad. Now this is written from the point of view of a Christian man, though I was very happily surprised by how relatively unbiased by religion the author was. Yes, he does inject a point of view that is tinted with Christian morality, but he also kind of takes feminist theory into account just a wee bit, and I was like, nice, I didn't expect that from you, bro. And then the third one I read was Pornland, written by Dr. Gail Dines. Dr. Gail Dines is a feminist lecturer activist who focuses on pornography and its harms. And well, no one will be surprised that that was my favorite out of the three. It was an excellent read, but like I said, it was triggering. Woo! I would recommend that book specifically on that subject, though I will acknowledge that I wouldn't find it unreasonable if some people thought it was already too biased for an overview or assessment of the topic. Although, that being said, I used to be way less porn critical than I am today, but personal experience has made me change my mind over the years, and this book only confirmed for me that I was right in changing my mind, so make of that what you will, but if you are feeling critical about pornography and want arguments to flesh out your opinion on the subject, then yes, do read Pornland by Dr. Gail Dines. Now I'm going to move on to what I'll call noteworthy fiction reads. First I do want to mention the fact that I did read William Shakespeare's Macbeth at the very beginning of last year. I have decided to read it because it was my ex's favorite Shakespeare play, and because it deals with Scotland and my ex is Scottish, I was in Scotland with him. And yeah, <laughs> it was fine. I didn't really vibe with it much, if at all, though as I stated at the time, I'm not really a big fan of reading plays. I would rather see plays performed at a theatre, so already the format was working against it, and I just didn't particularly connect with the themes. 
I did like the movie I saw with my ex, the movie adaptation, the 2015 Macbeth with Michael Fassbender and Marion Cotillard, I think it was. But at least I read it. I mean, I'd never read a Shakespeare play before because since I didn't go to secondary school in English, I never studied William Shakespeare in an academic context. So I did enjoy doing that for that reason, but it left me pretty indifferent. I did like the witches because witches. <laughs> I also want to mention the two Ian Banks novels I read, again on recommendation from my ex, I read Wit and the Wasp Factory, and I did a double book review for those if you're interested. And I did enjoy both. I mean, they weren't great reads, but they were enjoyable and interesting, primarily because of their main characters, who are both quite atypical, <laughs> each in his or her own way. In fact, I incorporated both of them in a video I did about atypical and or autistic characters, you may want to check out as well. It was a nice introduction to Ian Banks's bibliography. I am still interested in checking out a book at least from the Culture series at one point sometime in the future. I'm sorry this is a bit of a repeating theme, but he was very important to me even though the relationship was relatively short, I suppose, but so my ex recommended a few books to me and another one I did read last year was A Confederacy of Dunces written by John Kennedy Toole. I listened to it on audiobook and that was actually a really good choice on my part because the narration was actually really good with all the, well, New Orleans accents. It was really entertaining and I find it noteworthy because it's essentially a comedy, a comedy of manners, and I just don't really read comedy. I don't really read romance or comedy and I'm very particular about comedy and horror in literature, I just don't laugh or feel scared with books the way I could feel humoured or scared with like cinema or even video games for whatever reason. But I enjoy that one. It was indeed funny and it was also interesting because the main character is essentially heavily autistic coded in a way that very strongly reminded me of Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, except in this instance the main male character is more interested in the humanities rather than STEM. So I would actually recommend that one if you're looking for a comedy in literature featuring an atypical main character. Then I also read my first ever Stephen King last year. I read The Mist. I had previously seen the movie adaptation. I even saw, they never continued with it, did they? Like they did a first season of like a TV show adaptation for Netflix or something. Completely different from the book, I might add. The movie adaptation, however, is quite faithful. I had decently enjoyed the movie and I was like, eh? Because I'd seen actually a recent cover for The Mist <laughs> that featured purple tentacles and I was like, tentacles, Lovecraftian fiction, yes. And there are indeed tentacles in the text. I'm happy to report that the advertising via the cover art was accurate. There is a satisfactory amount of tentacles in that story, but beyond that I was surprised by how much I enjoyed the novella. I don't know why I had assumed I wouldn't particularly vibe with Stephen King's pro style for whatever reason, but no. It was really good. It was creepy, tentacly, cosmic horror and I had a good time. It was a solid 8 out of 10. So I'm definitely open to reading other stuff by Stephen King, though I am not in any hurry to do so either. And then I did also want to, you know, go over this one again, Orsinia written by Ursula K. Le Guin. Not because it's my favourite Le Guin by any means, but because now that I've read this, I have, I do believe, officially read all of Ursula K. Le Guin's published fiction. For adults at least, but I'm pretty sure I've read everything. There might actually be a couple novels she wrote featuring cats or something, flying cats, which kind of bugs me because I want to have <laughs> read all of her published fiction, but at the same time, not really interested in children's stories at this point in my life. Whatever, we'll put that to the side, but essentially I've more or less read all of Ursula Kellegrin's published fiction now that I've gone through Orsinia, which is neither fantasy or science fiction. It's alternative history slash general fiction essentially kind of reads like a 19th century novel. I mean, there's a novel in this book and then short stories. The novel reads like a 19th century novel. The short stories kind of reads like historical fiction, general fiction, I suppose. And I enjoyed it well enough. I didn't vibe that strongly with the novel or long novella short novel. I enjoyed some of the short stories more, but I read it because I said Killer Gwyn and now I have theoretically, let's say, a complete collection of published fiction. So yay for me. A fun 
funny little addition to the noteworthy reads. <laughs> it was uh, a new friend's recommendation. Had zero expectations for it going in, but I read Anne Bishop's Daughter of the Blood, and it's essentially quite edgy, steamy romance fantasy, and it just worked as the absolute perfect palate cleanser that I needed when I read it. And also it's noteworthy in the sense that it's hard to explain, but I was reading this book and I was like, this actually needs more sex in it. <laughs> which I was not expecting. So it's special for the fact that it kind of made me yearn for more overtly erotic writing, I guess. I'm definitely going to read the entire trilogy and I want to see if there is in fact more sex in books two and three, but yeah, it was special just for that. And like edgy imagery with blood, which is spiders, spider webs. So it was a lot of fun. When I was still with my ex, I had given him the <laughs> privilege of selecting five titles for my 2022 TBR. And I did read, besides some of the random recommendations I'd received from him, I did read all of those five picks for my 2022 TBR. None of them became new favorites, though some others of his recommendations did become new all-time favorites, but I'll get to those in a few minutes. So I read Dan Simmons' The Terror. Not a new all-time favorite, but very, very good. Like that was a solid 7.5 to soft, 8 out of 10 read. Pretty chonky tome of historical fiction with a nice dash of supernatural horror and just survival horror in the sense that it was oppressive because you have these people trying to survive in the Arctic and it bases itself on this lost expedition that was sent or sponsored by the British Navy to find the Northwest Passage in the 19th century. I did thoroughly enjoy it. I still have not watched the TV adaptation but I do want to at some point. I also read Dark Matter, kind of thematically related. So this is a Michelle Paver novel, a much shorter novel than the chonky The Terror. Also has to do with people going into the Arctic Circle and spooky stuff happening. It wasn't nearly as good, but it was still relatively enjoyable. And then I read this, Revelation Space, written by Alistair Reynolds, SF Masterworks. Yes, this is science fiction. It is space opera science fiction, and I liked it but I was disappointed by it. This was a solid 7 out of 10 read, still. Dark Matter, I believe, was a 6.5 out of 10. And so with this, I basically expected a lot more depth thematically. And, I don't know, just something more. And it felt a bit more about the popcorn factor and the entertainment value and the flashbangs than any thematic depth, really, or world building depth, I guess. I was very strongly reminded of the movie Interstellar for those reasons. So I was like a bit let down, but still I'm happy I read it. And hey, another item for my SF Masterworks semi-collection. Then I read The Secret History in October, I believe, and that was also fairly disappointing. So that's Dark Academia general fiction. It is one of Donna Tartt's novels and she's a highly praised and highly respected author. And I get it, but I was expecting something else from that novel. I was expecting a much greater involvement of ancient Greek pagan religion mysteries. There is a bit of that in the novel for a specific reason, but I was expecting a lot more of that. It's quite a psychological novel and I enjoyed some of the characters and like the group dynamic between the main characters. It kind of works in a way as a psychological thriller is not quite the right word, but just um, people fucking up and having to deal with the consequences of said fucking up linked to being at uni, hence the dark academia motif rather than theme. It was enjoyable, but it just didn't do it for me like I expected it to. So it didn't rise above a 6.5 out of 10 for me, but don't let that put you off the novel because a lot of people love it. So it might just very well work extremely well for you. And finally, in December, I read Weave World written by Clive Barker. And here again, <laughs> It's a book I feel I should have enjoyed a lot more than I actually did. Now, I talked about it in my last reading wrap-up, so I won't go into too much detail here again. But yeah, there was something magical about it. I love the prose, and there's the most beautiful, or I mean, most beautifully written lovemaking scene I've ever encountered in a novel, essentially. And there was some 
delicious horror and supernatural imagery wasn't in there. Make Angel scary again, am I right? <laughs> but there was something missing. And there was also a very bittersweet note for me in the very fact that this was the last of my excess picks for my TBR. So I was just feeling quite sad towards the end, especially since the actual last sentences of that novel felt like a... I'm not being delusional here, they just symbolically kind of felt like a message from my ex from the past, and that was quite painful for me, and so... That entire novel is just kind of in this weird emotional zone for me. There are things about the structure itself, about the plot, that just didn't quite work, but it, it was tainted in a way. So perhaps one day I will give it a second chance. It was still 7 out of 10, mind you, but I feel like it should be just a bit above that, you know what I mean? Now on to the worst of the worst. And thankfully for me, there isn't actually that much to cover in this section, so yay! So I did read Foundation by Isaac Asimov, because I watched the first season of the Apple TV Plus adaptation the previous year. And it wasn't garbage, don't get me wrong. It was just extremely bloody underwhelming. I listened to it on audio and it was like, oh god, I read it, I did my due diligence, and I'm done. <laughs> so bloody dry. If people think that Dune is golden age science fiction, or I mean, maybe it's not even classed that way actually, but if they just think that it's a bad example, or I mean, an example of the bad kind of classic science fiction, science fantasy, they think that's bad, do not read foundation ever, because it's a lot worse. It's dry as fuck, it wasn't that deep, but I read it! I did the thing, so uh, self-pat, but I will not be continuing with the series. That being said, if you love it, more power to you. And then the absolute worst thing by far I read last year, and one of the, if not the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life, was Manhunt, <laughs> written by Gretchen Felker Martin. I have a long, salty as fuck, and thorough rant review for that one. If you want to have a laugh, that was abject trash. Wow. Purportedly a sex based, or I mean, sex hormone based zombie werewolf plague apocalypse story that is honestly just as much porn as it is horror, splatterpunk, what the fuck have you. It was a thing I read to better digest normal people, which was wrecking my heart hard. I guess it kind of was entertaining at the beginning because it was a meme read more than anything else, but it is genuinely trash. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, if you want to hear more thoughts about it, there's a video for that for you. I mean, they weren't all bad, but I must mention once again the fact that I did do a reading challenge for the first ever edition of the Ursula K. Le Guin Prize for Fiction. It was a terrible idea on my part because it sent me straight into a reading burnout, but yeah, the book that should have won it and it didn't win, in my opinion, is Elder Race, written by Adrian Tchaikovsky, which is a new all-time favorite, more on that in a few seconds, but uh, the best book I read for that challenge was How High We Are in the Dark, written by Sequoia Nagamatsu, and that was a 6.5 out of 10. Like, that was the best of the nominees I read for the challenge. And the other books that were nominated and that I thus read were The Employees, written by Olga Raven. That was just like, what? <laughs> Apple Seed written by Matt Bell. There was a fawn for no reason I could detect, and it was just no. The past is red was alright. It stuck to its idea and just ran with it, so I can respect that, but still, there's whatever. And that was by Catherine M. Valenti. There was Some in the City of Roses written by Michelle Reese Keel. That was essentially a coming of age magical realism story. And okay, it featured an autistic character, but in a way that was mildly problematic, I kind of guess. And the magical realism element was just like, what the fuck is happening right now? There was A Snake Falls to Earth, written by Darcy Little Badger, that is a children's book as far as I'm concerned, or very young YA, and I'm not about that. And it was cute, but nothing beyond that. There was After the Dragons, written by Cynthia Stang, and it featured cute little dragons, but it was essentially a very soft cool gay romance. Yippee. And then there was The House of Rust, written by Khadija Abdallah Bajaba, and I didn't have that one. <laughs> because it just broke me. I was like not interested and I was burnt out to high hell. And so actually, again, self-pat for actually DNFing for my own mental health. So I really don't have much to say about it because I didn't finish it, so no rating for that, obviously. And the others, I mean, I did a reading wrap-up that basically covered all of those if you want to see the ratings for each of them, but the highest was a 6.5 out of 10. That should tell you all you need to know there. And now on to the best of the very best. Like I said, I acquired five new 
as of today, <laughs> all-time favorites across all the main branches of fiction I read, so general science fiction and fantasy, so yay for me, I have reviews, dedicated reviews for all of them, so if you're interested in particular thoughts about any one of them, there you go, enjoy yourselves, if you so wish. So I'm just going to kind of rapidly go over them. First, though, I will mention the two amazing rereads I went through. So the very first book I finished in 2022, well, kind of, but basically was The Birthday of the World and other stories written by none other than Ursula K. Le Guin. This was, is, and will probably remain my favourite short story collection by her. It even has kind of a novella at the very end, and I enjoyed it even more than I did the first time I read it. This is Ursula K. Le Guin at her very best. It is just delicious. And then I reread the Southern Reach trilogy written by Jeff Vandermeer with the first book being Annihilation, of course, followed with Authority and Acceptance. And apparently there's going to be a book for at some point called Absolution. I'm very scared though. I'm scared. Please don't fuck it up. Please, 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 please. But anyway, the main trilogy, I remembered, you know, loving it. I did devour it in like two days the first time I read it. So of course I had to reread it to confirm that first very solid impression. And there again, I enjoyed it even more than I did the first time around, even though I read it at a terrible time, just terrible. I feel like if I were to reread it in the future again, I'd enjoy it even more because the emotional impact would be less, you know, muted by the stuff that was happening. But so this is just amazing and definitely my favorite science fiction series of all time. So not standalone, but series. Oh yes. Just um, read it if you haven't yet. Duh. <laughs> then moving on to new reads, I read this, The Magicians, written by Lev Grossman. And even though I'd heard about it before knowing him, I wouldn't have read it without my ex. So thank you to him for giving me the push I needed to actually pick this up. This was so good. This was an 8.5 out of 10 for me. A lot of people hate Quentin. Big whoop, <laughs> I guess. To me, this just contains a brilliant representation of the experience of depression and, you know, mental illness in general within a fantasy setting. And it also kind of references fantasy in a very adult way. It's both whimsical and dark and it's rich, and it's well written, and I will in fact be reading The Magician King this year on uh, very friendly pushing and advice from a friend. I hope it's worth my time! <laughs> But this one is definitely brilliant. And what's wonderful is that it works as a standalone in any case. So if you just want to read this one, do read this one. That's also the brilliant thing about The Sudden Reach, by the way. Annihilation, you can just read and stop there because it's essentially a flawless first book. I mean, I love the trilogy as a whole, but you can just stop at Annihilation and it's just brilliant on its own. This is a new all-time favorite in fantasy, most definitely. And I thought that would be my go-to recommendation for mental illness representation within SFF, but then I read this gem. Ella Ray is written by Adrian Tchaikovsky, and this is borderline even better than what you get in The Magician. So, spoiled for choice, you have two options for decent mental, well, more than decent, excellent mental illness representation in SFF. Holy shit, was this good, and this is novella length too, so you can just read this in a day if you want. Not only is there a beautifully poignant portrayal of the experience of severe clinical depression in this, it also plays around with the theme of Arthur C. Clarke's Third Lord Science Fiction absolutely brilliantly. It is concise, beautiful, moving, amazing. And it was written in a way that really strongly reminded me of us like Le Guin's fiction, which is also why I think this should have won the very first as like Le Guin prize for fiction, but uh, I wasn't one of the judges, was I? <laughs> very strong recommendation, as far as I'm concerned. I've had successes and misses with Adrian Tchaikovsky, it's kind of strange, but this one is most definitely worth your while, along with Children of Time, though extremely different. So this is also now a new author time science fiction favorite. Then moving to general fiction for a little bit, yes I've decided I'm not gonna call it literary fiction anymore because literary just references literature. Science fiction and fantasy literature are part of literature as well, so it just kind of sounds stupid to me, or I mean very illogical, so now it's just general fiction from my part. So if you were confused about that, for me now literary fiction is just general fiction. Oh, okay. So this bitch. <laughs> 
I will, I think forever now just re <laughs> reference normal people as this bitch. Because <laughs> she wrecked my heart, okay? And she's a she, apparently. Just don't ask me why, because I don't know. Sally Rooney's normal people. Holy shit. Also, kind of a recommendation from my ex. What the actual fuck? This hit me in the feels way harder than it had any right to. I had a full-on meltdown when I finished it, partly because I very strongly projected myself and my relationship with my ex onto this thing, because that's just the way it is. And also, I think that the main female character is autistic coded, and I extremely strongly related to her, which is very rare for me, because I'm not a character-driven reader at all. Probably, partly in fact, because I am autistic. Uh, it's a love story. I mean, it's not a romance, technically speaking. I stand by that. It's not a romance, but it is the story of a love story of the love between a man and a woman, or I mean, a young man and a young woman, and just going through life and having ups and downs in their relationships because they are not normal people. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of one of those titles that just kind of... you get it. And now I haven't seen the TV show yet. I'm scared to. <laughs> Because it's, it's gonna be painful. And staying in the domain of general fiction, not quite as strong of an emotional punch, but it was still excellent. So by the way, Normal People was a 9 out of 10 for me. Elder Race was a straight up 10. This one, Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, written by Gail Honeyman, was an 8.5 out of 10. Great novel. Great, as far as I'm concerned, and I do not care what the author said about this herself. Great autistic coded slash CPTSD representation. And just a lovely story. I mean, well, uh, there's a lot of darkness in here and content warnings. Check that out if you're interested. So yeah, but it made me feel good at the end. I mean, it moved me and it hurt as well, but it also made me feel good. Perhaps in a way that wasn't entirely realistic, but sometimes you don't need things to be entirely realistic, you know what I mean? And finally, this! This wonder, Hollow Kingdom, written by Kira Jane Buxton, and I read the sequel, Feral Creatures, in the month of January. Oh wow, this new all time. It's neither really science fiction or fantasy properly. I mean, I shoved it onto the fancy list, whatever. It's just an all time SFF favorite. This was a 10 out of 10 read for me. You know how rare that is? Holy shit, I felt everything reading this. The mind, the heart, the fucking soul. I shed rivers, I mean good rivers, <laughs> of tears reading this. And Crow main freaking character, fluffy freaking dinosaur, all the feels, beautiful, incredibly rich, variegated prose in a way that shouldn't have worked for me, but it did. The theming is rich. The character work is rich. All the main characters are freaking non-human animals and they feel realistic. I mean, they're still anthropomorphized because there's just no way you're gonna do that otherwise, but to a reasonable amount. Otherwise, they really are their species. And ST is just god tier character. <laughs> Love this, love this, love this. Please read this. I mean, if you like these kinds of stories with like non-human animal characters and just go see my review if you need reasons to pick this up. Obviously it's not gonna work for everyone, but holy shit that I love this. And so I did want to go over a couple of videos I did last year that I, I'm kind of happy I did. I did three videos about my very personal experience with like mental illness, abuse, but specifically autism. I think that one in particular was very important to talk about the ways in which I am autistic and to just raise a bit of extra awareness about that from, I guess, you know, my vantage point as a bookworm and a booktuber. I know others have done similar things in other corners of YouTube and you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm happy I did that. I'm also really happy I did my video with atypical and all autistic coded characters because it's a neat little reference. Perhaps I'll update it. Well, I mean, hopefully, yeah, I'll update it one day as well. And then, <laughs> well, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that uh, I went over the very first season of Rings of Power with you all. That was an interesting little experience. Unfortunately, it did send me into burnout as well because I had not planned it in advance. I hadn't prepared it. So it took a huge chunk of energy out of me. I'm still glad I did it, but I would not do this again the way I did. I would consider doing something similar again one day, but I would prepare it beforehand a lot more. Still, a lot of you seem to enjoy me losing my shit over Rings of Power and kind of going into mini acting mode. I mean, all my reactions were genuine. They might have been a wee bit exaggerated for entertainment, but I still stand by every single thing I said though. And a lot of you also seem to appreciate my review for season one, so thank you, all the views and the comments. It's quite a bit of 
fun though, like I said. I won't do it the same way next time if I do something like this another time. And now on to a sneak peek at my 2023 TBR. So this year there are a few series within SFF that I plan on reading of like, you know, classics in a way, or I mean well-known titles. So currently actually I am going through the Book of the New Sun written by Gene Wolfe. I plan on reading the Xenogenesis trilogy written by Octavia E. Butler. I plan on reading the Kingkiller Chronicles <laughs> written by Patrick Rothfuss so I can have another series I'm sad about. <laughs> I mean, if I like it, but it comes very highly recommended from someone whose literary tastes I trust. I mean, we don't always love the same things, but we have significant overlap in our tastes, so I trust the recommendation, but then, yeah, if I do like it, I can be sad about two fancy series that aren't finished. Yay! <laughs> And then I would also like this year to read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. I was supposed to read it last year, but alas, the end of last year was chaotic and marked by burnout and depression. So hopefully this year is the year. I still have the Wolf Hall trilogy to read. This was a gift from my ex, so I do have the hardbacks for it. But again, didn't have time to read it last year, so this year should be it. I also have the Gorman Gas trilogy on my TBR. I am actually looking forward to that one. I have have a collection of Mieville short stories. That should just be enjoyable for me because Mieville is one of my all-time favorite authors. There are the other two novels by Sally Rooney that I decided that I'm gonna read because why not? I kind of bought the physical copies when I was in London on a whim, so yeah. <laughs> I also, it's a bit out of left field, I suppose, I have Usumaki by Junji Ito on my physical TBR because I want to read some cosmic horror and he's very well known for writing cosmic horror mangas and so I was like, yes, bring it on. <laughs> So hopefully I'll enjoy it though. I've never been terribly attracted by the art style in manga, to be perfectly honest, but that it should be worth it. It should be worth my while, so fingers crossed. And then as far as rereads go, I already reread Atonement and that was very enjoyable. I plan on rereading both Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights, and I'll also be rereading two novels in science fiction, It Women's Country by Sherry S. Tepper and Women on the Edge of Time, written by Marge Piercy. And as to the rest, well, you should you'll see as the months, as the year unfolds. So that'll be all for this yearly reading wrap up. I hope you had a good 2022. Ideally both in your personal life and your reading life. And on that note, I hope you will have a lovely day, evening, or whichever time of day you prefer. Sincerely, thank you for your continued support, especially after my long absence. I hope you will take good care of yourselves as much as you can, really. And I shall see you all in another video, at the very least, you know, the next monthly reading wrap up. But until then, Bye-bye.